Imagine bacteria with little tentacle-like extensions moving through your urethra or uterus and using those tentacle-like extensions to attach to and infect your cells. Yes, everyone, this is Neisseria gonorrhea using its pili to infect you with gonorrhea, also sometimes referred to as the clap. Now, hopefully it's not really infecting you, but it did infect over 600,000 people in the United States during 2023. And that number is actually likely much higher due to underreporting of cases. And one of the reasons why it is underreported is that gonorrhea can be asymptomatic in many people. So someone could be spreading and infecting other people with gonorrhea and not even know it. So today we're gonna to talk about how it does spread, what symptoms it does cause in those that do experience symptoms, and probably the most scary thing about gonorrhea. Gonorrhea is becoming harder and harder to treat and cure. So we're gonna talk about why that is. And as a bonus, we're gonna talk about different patient cases that I've had where certain patients have had gonorrhea multiple times. So how would you approach patient cases like this? It's definitely going to be an interesting discussion. And for those of you that are new to the channel, I'm Jonathan Benyon with the Institute of Human Anatomy, and it's time to jump into some anatomical awesomeness. As I previously mentioned, gonorrhea is caused by the bacterium Neisseria gonorrhea, and it's most often transmitted sexually. Now I say most often because there are some cases where this can be transmitted non-sexually, and I'll give an example of that later on in the video. But what are the signs and symptoms of the sexually transmitted form of gonorrhea? Well, let's start with how females are typically affected and then move on to how males are affected. The most commonly infected structure in females is the cervix of the uterus, which you can see half of the cervix of the uterus right here in this awesome sagittal dissection. But just to orient you a little bit further to this dissection, here you can see the pubic bone, you can see the bladder, the vaginal canal, here's the anus, and here's the body of the uterus, and again, the cervix of the uterus right here. But when the cervix of the uterus is infected with gonorrhea, what are those symptoms? Well, what's crazy is that some studies have found that up to 70% of cases of gonococcal cervical infections can be asymptomatic, which again means that someone can have this infection and just be spreading it around unknowingly. But when there are symptoms, they typically include things like vaginal irritation and itching, abnormal vaginal discharge, and intermenstrual bleeding, which is bleeding between periods. Another commonly infected site in females is the urethra. And like the infection of the cervix, urethral infections can also be asymptomatic. However, in the majority of cases where the urethra is infected, 90% of those cases will also include cervical infections. And if there are symptoms of the urethra being infected, these would include things like dysuria, which is pain and burning during urination, urgency and frequency, which is frequent urges to urinate. Now, a female could have all of these symptoms, dysuria, urgency, frequency, abnormal vaginal discharge, and vaginal irritation, or just a subset. But something else that is important to keep in mind with some of these symptoms like dysuria, urgency, and frequency, is that these are very similar to symptoms that one can experience with a basic UTI or urinary tract infection from different types of bacteria. And so when I have a patient that comes in to the clinic with UTI symptoms, it's good practice to also assess the patient's risk for a sexually transmitted infection. And depending on the patient's history and risk, we may also include STI testing with the typical UTI testing. Now, there's also one other major concern for females that have asymptomatic gonorrhea infections, or at least asymptomatic during initial infection. Gonorrhea can ascend further into the female reproductive tract, meaning it can move further up into say like the body of the uterus, into the uterine tubes, which are also known as the fallopian tubes. It can also affect the ovary and even the parietal peritoneum, which is this thin tissue membrane lining the pelvis. And when this ascending infection occurs, it is known as pelvic inflammatory disease, or PID. About 10 to 20% of untreated gonorrhea cases develop into PID. And again, this is often because the initial infection was asymptomatic. But when symptoms of PID begin, this can include lower abdominal and pelvic pain, abnormal bleeding between periods, and dyspareunia, which is a fancy pants way of saying pain during intercourse. Now, PID is treatable, although there continues to be increasing concerns about the treatability of gonorrhea infections that we'll talk about soon. But one of the biggest concerns about PID that we'll discuss now is that it can cause scarring within the uterine tubes, which can lead to infertility 
or ectopic pregnancy. And an ectopic pregnancy is when a fertilized egg implants outside of the uterus, typically in the uterine tube, which can be life-threatening and requires immediate treatment. And we actually have a full video on ectopic pregnancies that I'll link at the end of this video. But now let's move on to how gonorrhea affects males. The most commonly infected site in males is the urethra. Although men can also be asymptomatic, most STI clinic-based studies suggest that males are more likely to be symptomatic than females, with some studies suggesting that the majority of males will develop symptoms. When they do have symptoms, these include urethral discharge that is often described as mucopergulant, which is mucus and pus mixed together, as well as dysuria, which again is painful urination. Sometimes the infection can ascend and move to structures higher upstream, such as the testicles, specifically the epididymis, which is this C-shaped structure that you can see on this dissection that is surrounding the testicles. And if gonorrhea does infect the epididymis, symptoms can be unilateral testicular pain and testicular swelling. Now, there are other sites that gonorrhea can infect beyond the genitals, and this can include things like the rectum through anal intercourse, with symptoms being rectal pain, bleeding, discharge, or a constant urge to defecate. The throat can also be affected in cases of oral intercourse, and this may result in a sore throat, swollen lymph nodes, or even pus in the throat. And the eyes can even be infected, specifically the conjunctiva, which is the outer lining of the eye. Now, maybe you've heard of pink eye or conjunctivitis, and pink eye and conjunctivitis is most typically caused by viruses or other bacteria, but gonorrhea can cause it too. But this is the case where it would be considered non-sexually transmitted, as this most commonly affects newborns passing through the birth canal of an infected mother. Now, with all of this discussion about asymptomatic cases that we've talked about previously, this highlights the importance of testing. Not only does testing confirm the diagnosis and guide treatment, but it can obviously catch those asymptomatic cases and reduce the risk of spread and further health complications. And the best test for gonorrhea is the nucleic acid amplification test, which detects the genetic material, the DNA of Neisseria gonorrhea. And this test can be done using a urine sample or even a swab of the infected area. So now let's talk treatment and why this is becoming more concerning. The first line treatment for gonorrhea is an antibiotic called ceftriaxone, or maybe you've heard of it by its brand name, Rocephin. And this is given as a 500 milligram intramuscular injection. So it's typically a shot in the gluteal muscles. And as an FYI, people are often treated for chlamydia at the same time because people can have these infections together. But we have a whole other video on chlamydia that I'll also link at the end of this one. However, when I first started practicing medicine, the dose was 250 milligrams. But gonorrhea is becoming increasingly more resistant to ceftriaxone and other antibiotics. And they have even isolated some strains of gonorrhea that have developed a very high level of resistance to ceftriaxone, with the concern being that this antibiotic may not continue to work on some of those strains. And if you haven't heard of antibiotic resistance before, it is both fascinating and a little scary. Bacteria have this incredible ability to adapt and develop mechanisms to resist antibiotics. Some of these mechanisms include the bacteria learning how to prevent the antibiotics from actually getting inside them by either changing the permeability of their cell walls or even creating cellular pumps that pump out or expel the antibiotic before it can do its damage. Bacteria have also developed mechanisms to modify the target of the antibiotic. So the antibiotic can no longer bind to that target and therefore is rendered ineffective. And some bacteria have developed enzymes that can break down and modify the antibiotic. And obviously, when these bacteria divide and copy themselves, the new bacterial cells also have these abilities. And if that wasn't enough, the bacteria can share this information with their neighboring buddy bacterial cells by sharing some of their genes or genetic information, thereby helping those nearby bacterial buddies to also become resistant. So if that scared you a little bit, I apologize. Mostly, maybe it's slightly a good thing, but I do need to say that luckily most strains of gonorrhea are still treatable with ceftriaxone. But we still need to be careful and try to reduce the spread and also reduce the progression of antibiotic resistance. This is obviously going to be done with safe sex practices through using protection like a condom, getting tested when appropriate. As again, we have obviously stressed that people can have this infection and not know it. And then we come to this potentially heated discussion of public health responsibility. And what I mean by that is, do each of us have a responsibility to do our part in trying to minimize the spread of infections throughout our communities? 
Again, people have varying opinions on this, but I'll just contribute some quick examples and facts as food for thought. Now, most patients that I've treated for gonorrhea aren't really happy about it. Contracting the infection was accidental, and many of them I don't see or treat again. But I've also had other patients that have had gonorrhea multiple times and haven't seemed as concerned about it as those other patient examples. But here's the reality. Individuals who are repeatedly infected with gonorrhea play an important role in maintaining the spread of gonorrhea within communities and in the development and spread of antibiotic-resistant strains of gonorrhea. Now, no matter the patient, I'm always going to do my best to create a safe, non-judgmental environment where the person can talk with me openly and get the care that is needed. But how far should a healthcare provider go with situations of multiple repeat STI infections? Should the healthcare provider just get the history, make the diagnosis, treat appropriately, and then leave it at that? Or does the healthcare provider have a responsibility to also discuss information about what repeat infections can do for, say, something like antibiotic resistance and public health? I know what my take is on this, and I think that healthcare providers can provide factual and useful information in a tactful way that would give the patient information about the risks of repeat infections for themselves and their future health, as well as for those that they come in contact with. But I'd love to know what your take is on this, so leave some comments about that below. One of my hopes with every single video that we create is to inspire you to become a lifelong learner. If you take a little bit of time each day to learn something new, over days, weeks, months, and years, you'll build an incredible base of knowledge. And that's exactly why we continue to partner with Brilliant, the sponsor of today's video. Brilliant helps you to get smarter every day through thousands of interactive lessons in math, science, programming, data analysis, and even AI. Brilliant's lessons are designed to be uniquely effective as their first principles approach builds understanding from the ground up through problem solving and engaging hands-on exploration, turning you into a better thinker and not just a memorizer. And of course, the science nerd in me is going to geek out about brilliant science courses as these courses help you make sense of our universe at every level, from the mechanics of simple machines all the way to the mind-bending physics of black holes. And so if you want to try Brilliant for free, visit brilliant.org IHA or scan the QR code on screen, or you can click on the link in the description. You'll also get 20% off an annual premium subscription. Thanks so much for watching today's video, everyone. If you enjoyed it, we'd love for you to be likers and subscribers of our channel. So engage those skeletal muscles and click appropriately. And we'll see you in the next video.